Section 9 of Astounding Stories 4, April 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, Chapters 19 and 20. Chapter 19, In the Zed Light Glow. Try again, by the infernal snap, Dean, if you do anything to balk us. Miko scanned the apparatus with keen eyes. How much technical knowledge of signaling instruments did this brigand leader have? I was tense and cold with apprehension as I sat in a corner of the helio room, watching Snap. Could Miko be fooled? Snap, I knew, was trying to fool him. The moon spread close beneath us. My log chart, computed up to thirty minutes past, showed us barely some thirty thousand miles over the moon's surface. The globe lay in quadranture beneath our bow quarter, a huge quadrant spreading across the black starry vault of the lower heavens a silver quadrant. The sunset caught the lunar mountains, flung slanting shadows over the empty lunar plains. All the disk was plainly visible. The mellow earthlight glowed serene and pale to illumine the lunar night. The planetara was bathed in silver. A brilliant silver glare swept the forward deck, clean white and splashed with black shadows. We had partly circled the moon, so as now to approach it from the earthward side. I had worked with extreme concentration through the last hours, plotting the trajectory of our curving sweep, setting the gravity plates with constantly shifting combinations, and with it a necessity for the steady retarding of our velocity. Miko, for a time, was at my elbow in the turret. I had not seen Coniston and Han of recent hours. I had slept, awakened refreshed, and had a meal. Coniston and Han remained below, one or the other of them always with the crew to execute my sirened orders. Then Coniston came to take my place in the turret, and I went with Miko to the helio room. You are skillful, Haljan. A measure of grim approval was in Miko's voice. You evidently have no wish to try and fool me in this navigation. I had not, indeed. It is delicate work at best, coping with the intricacies of celestial mechanics upon a semicircular trajectory with retarding velocity, and with a makeshift crew we could easily have come upon real difficulty. We hung at last, hull down, facing the earthward hemisphere of the lunar disk. The giant ball of the earth lay behind and above us, the sun over our stern quarter. With forward velocity almost checked, we poised, and Snap began his signals to the unsuspecting Grantline. My work momentarily was over. I sat watching the helio room. Moa was here close beside me. I felt always her watchful gaze, so that even the play of my expression needed reining. Miko worked with Snap. Anita, too, was here. To Miko and Moa it was the somber, taciturn George Prince, shrouded always in his black morning cloak, disinclined to talk, sitting alone, brooding, and cowardly sullen. Miko repeated, by the infernal, if you try to fool me, Snap Dean. The small metal room with its grid floor and low arched ceiling glared with moonlight through its windows. The moving figures of Snap and Miko were aped by the grotesque misshapen shadows of them on the walls. Miko gigantic, a great menacing ogre. Snap small and alert, a trim pale figure in his tight-fitting white trousers, broad flowing belt, and white shirt open at the throat. His face was pale and drawn from lack of sleep, and the torture to which Miko had subjected him. But he grinned at the brigand's words, and pushed his straggling hair closer under the red eyeshade. I'm doing my best, Nico. You can believe it. The room over long periods was deadly silent, with Miko and Snap bending watchfully at the crowded banks of instruments. A silence in which my own pounding heart seemed to echo. I did not dare look at Anita, nor she at me. Snap was trying to signal Earth, not the moon. His main helios were set in the reverse. The infrared waves, frung from the bow window, were of a frequency which Snap and I believed that Grantline could not pick up. And over against the wall, close beside me and seemingly ignored by Snap, there was a little ultraviolet sender. Its faint hum and the quivering of its mirrors had so far passed unnoticed. Would some Earth station pick it up? I prayed so. There was a thumbnail mirror here which could bring an answer. 
I prayed that it might swing. Would some Earth telescope be able to see us? I doubted it. The pinpoint of the planetara's infinitesimal bulk would be beyond them. Long silences broken only by the faint hiss and murmur of Snap's instruments. Shall I try the graphs, Miko? Yes. I helped him with the spectroheliograph. At every level the plate showed us nothing save the scarred and pitted moon surface. We worked for an hour. There was nothing. Bleak, cold night on the moon here beneath us. A touch of fading sunlight upon the Apennines. Up near the south pole, Tycho, with its radiating open rills, stood like a grim, dark maw. Miko bent over a plate. Something here? Is there? An abnormality upon the frowning, ragged cliffs of Tycho? We thought so, but then it seemed not. Another hour. No signal came from Earth. If Snap's calls were getting through, we had no evidence of it. Abruptly, Miko strode at me from across the room. I went cold and tense. Moa shifted alert to my every movement. But Miko was not interested in me. A sweep of his clenched fist knocked the ultraviolet sender and its coils and mirrors in a tinkling crash to the grid at my feet. We don't need that, whatever it is. He rubbed his knuckles where the violet waves had tinged them and turned grimly back to Snap. Where are your gamma ray mirrors? If the treasure is exposed... The Martian's knowledge was far greater than we believed. He grinned sardonically at Anita. If our treasure is on this hemisphere, Prince, we should pick up gamma rays? Don't you think so? Or is Grantline so cautious it will all be protected? Anita spoke in a careful, throaty drawl. The gamma rays came plain enough when we passed here on the way out. You should know, grinned Nico. An expert eavesdropper, Prince, I will say that for you. Come, Dean, try something else. By God, if Grantline does not signal us, I will be likely to blame you. My patience is shortening. Shall we go closer, Haljan? I don't think it would help, I said. He nodded. Perhaps not. Are we checked? Yes. We were poised very nearly motionless. If you wish in advance, I can ring it. But we need a surface destination now. True, Haljan. He stood thinking. Would a Zed ray penetrate those crater cliffs? Tycho, for instance, at this angle? It might, Snap agreed. You think he may be on the northern inner side of Tycho? He may be anywhere, said Miko shortly. If you think that, Snap persisted, suppose we swing the planetara over the south pole. Tycho viewed from there, and take another quarter day of time, Miko sneered. Flash on your Zed ray. Help him hook it up, Haljan. I moved to the lens box of the spectroheliograph. It seemed that Snap was very strangely reluctant. Was it because he knew that the Grantline camp lay concealed on the northern inner wall of Tycho's giant ring? I thought so. But Snap flashed a queer look at Anita. She did not see it, but I did, and I could not understand it. My accursed witless incapacity. If only I had taken warning. Here, commanded Miko, a score of graphs with a Zed ray. I tell you I will comb this surface if we have to stay here until our ship comes from Ferrick Shan to join us. The Martian brigands were coming. Miko's signals had been answered. In ten days, the other brigand ship, adequately manned and armed, would be here. Snap helped me connect the Zed ray. He did not dare even to whisper to me, with Moa hovering always so close. And for all Miko's sardonic smiling, we knew that he would tolerate nothing from us now. He was fully armed, and so was Moa. I recall that Snap several times tried to touch me significantly. Oh, if only I had taken warning. We finished our connecting. The dull gray point of Zed Ray gleamed through the prisms to mingle with the moonlight entering the main lens. I stood with a shutter trip. The same interval, Snap? Yes. Beside me, I was aware of a faint reflection of the Zed lights a gray cathedral shaft crossing the helio room and falling upon the opposite wall. An unreality there as the Zed light faintly strove to penetrate the metal room side. I said, shall I make the exposure? Snap nodded, but that graph was never made. An exclamation from Moa made us all turn. The gamma mirrors were quivering. Grantline had picked our signal with what undoubtedly was an intensified receiving equipment which Snap had not thought Grantline able to use, 
he had caught our faint zed rays which snap was sending only to deceive miko and grantline had recognized the planetara and had released his occulting screen surrounding the radium ore the gamma rays were here unmistakable and upon their heels came grantline's message not in the secret system he had arranged with snap but unsuspectingly in open code i could read the swinging mirror and so could miko and miko decoded it triumphantly aloud surprised but pleased your return approach mid-northern hemisphere region of archimedes forty thousand toises off nearest apennine range the message broke off but even its importance was overshadowed miko stood in the center of the helio room triumphantly reading the light indicator its beam swung on the scale which chanced to be almost directly over anita's head i saw miko's expression change a look of surprise amazement came to him why he gasped he stood staring almost stupidly staring for an instant and as i regarded him with fascinated horror there came upon his heavy gray face a look of dawning comprehension and i heard snap's startled intake of breath he moved to the spectroheliograph where the zed rays connections were still humming but with a leap miko flung him away off with you moa watch him haljan don't move again miko stood staring oh dear god i saw now he was staring at anita why george prince how strange you look anita did not move she was stricken with horror she shrank back against the wall huddled in her cloak miko's sardonic voice came again how strange you look prince he took a step forward he was grim and calm horribly calm deliberate gloating like a great gray monster in human form toying with a fascinated imprisoned bird move just a little prince let the zed ray light fall more fully anita's head was bare that pale hamlet like face dear god the zed light reflection lay gray and penetrating upon it miko took another step peering grinning how amazing george prince why i can hardly believe it moa was armed with an electronic cylinder for all her amazement what turgid emotion sweeping her i can only guess she never took her eyes from snap and me back don't move either of you she hissed at us then miko leaped at anita like a giant gray leopard pouncing away with that cloak prince i stood cold and numbed and realization came at last the faint zed light glow had fallen by chance upon anita's face penetrated the flesh exposed faintly glowing the bone line of her jaw unmasked the waxen art of gluts and miko had seen it why george how surprising away with that cloak he seized her wrist drew her forward beyond the shaft of zed light into the brilliant light of the moon and ripped her cloak from her the gentle curves of her woman's figure were so unmistakable and as miko gazed at them all his calm triumph swept away why anita i heard moa mutter so that is it a venomous flashing look a shaft from me to anita and back again so that is it why anita miko's great arms gathered her up as though she were a child so i have you back from the dead delivered back to me greg snaps warning and his grip over my shoulders brought me a measure of sanity i had tensed to spring i stood quivering and moa thrust her weapon against my face the helio mirrors were swaying again with another message from grantline but it came ignored by all of us in the glare of moonlight by the forward window miko held anita his great hands pawing her with triumphant possessive caresses so little anita you are given back to me against her futile struggles he held her dear god if only i had had the wit to have prevented this chapter twenty the grantline camp in the mid-northern hemisphere upon the eastward side of the moon the giant crater of archimedes stood brooding in silent majesty grim lofty walls broken pitted and scarred rising precipitous to the upper circular rim night had just fallen the sunlight clung to the crater heights it tinged with flame the jagged peaks of the apennine mountains which rose in tears at the horizon and it flung great inky shadows over the intervening lowlands northward 
The mare Imbrium stretched mysterious and purple, its million rills and ridges and crater holes flattened by distance and the gathering darkness into a seemingly level surface. The night slowly deepened. The dead black vault of the sky blazed with its brilliant starry gems. The gibbous earth hung high above the horizon, motionless, save for the invisible pendulum sway over the tiny arc of its libration. Widening to quadrature, casting upon the bleak naked lunar landscape its mellow earth glow. Slow, measured process, this coming of the lunar night. For an earth day, the sunset slowly faded on the Apennines. The poised earth widened a little further, an earth day of time, with the earth disk visibly rotating, the faint tracery of its oceans and continents passing in slow, majestic review. Another earth day interval, then another, and another. Full night now enveloped Archimedes. Splotches of earth light and starlight sheen slowly shifted as the night advanced. Between the great crater and the nearby mountains, the broken, pseudo-level lowlands were wan in the earthlight. A few hundred miles, as distance would have been measured upon Earth. A million million rills were there. Valleys and ridges, ravines, sharp-walled canyons, cliffs and crags, tiny craters like pockmarks. Naked, gray, porous rock everywhere. This denuded landscape. Cracked and scarred and tumbled, as though some inexorable titan torch had seared and crumbled and broken it, left it now congealed like a wind-lashed sea abruptly frozen into immobility. Moonlight upon earth so gently shines to make romantic a lover's smile. But the reality of the lunar night is cold beyond human rationality. Cold and darkly silent. Grim desolation. Awesome. Majestic. A frowning majesty that even to the most intrepid human beholder is inconceivably forbidding. And there were humans here now. On this tumbled plain, between Archimedes and the mountains, one small crater amid the millions of its fellows was distinguished this night by the presence of humans, the Grantline camp. It huddled in the deepest purple shadows on the side of a bowl-like pit, a crudely circular orifice with a scant two miles across its rippling rim. There was faint light here to mark the presence of the living intruders. The blue glow radiance of Morel tube lights under a spread of glassite. The Grantline camp stood midway up one of the inner cliff walls of the little crater. The broken, rock-strewn floor, two miles wide, lay five hundred feet below the camp. Behind it, the jagged, precipitous cliff rose another five hundred to the heights of the upper rim. A broad, level shelf hung midway up the cliff, and upon it Grantline had built his little group of glassite dome shelters. Viewed from above, there was the darkly purple crater floor, the upflung circular rim where the earthlight tinged the spires and crags with yellow sheen, and on the shelf, like a huddled group of birds' nests, Grantline's domes clung and gazed down upon the inner valley. Intricate task, the building of these glassite shelters. There were three. The main one stood close at the brink of the ledge, a quadrangle of glassite walls a hundred feet in length by half as wide and a scant ten feet high to its flat-arched dome roof. Built for this purpose in Great New York, Grantline had brought his aluminite girders and braces and the glassite panels in sections. The air here on the moon's surface was negligible, a scant one five-thousandth of the atmospheric pressure at the sea level on Earth. But within the glassite shelter, a normal Earth pressure must be maintained. Rigidly braced double walls to withstand the explosive tendency with no external pressure to counteract it. A tremendous necessity for mechanical equipment had burdened Grantline's small ship to its capacity. The chemistry of manufactured air, the pressure equalizers, renewers, respirators, the lighting and temperature maintenance systems, all the mechanics of a space flyer were here. And within the glassite double walls there was necessity for a constant circulation of the Arendt's temperature insulating system. There was this main Grantline building, stretching low and rectangular upon the front edge of the ledge. Within it were living rooms, mess room, and kitchen. Fifty feet behind it, connected by a narrow passage of glassite, was a similar, though smaller, structure. The mechanical control rooms, with their humming, vibrating mechanisms, were here. And an instrument room, with signaling apparatus, 
senders, receivers, mirror grids, and audiophones of several varieties. And an electrotelescope, small but modern, with dome overhead like a little earth observatory. From this instrument building, beside the connecting pedestrian passage, wire cables for light, and air tubes and strings and bundles of instrument wires ran to the main structure, gray snakes upon the porous gray lunar rock. The third building seemed a lean-to banked against the cliff wall, a shanting shed wall of glassite fifty feet high and two hundred in length. Under it, for months, Grantline's borers had dug into the cliff. Brace tunnels were here, penetrating back and downward into this vein of radioactive rock. The work was over now. The borers had been dismantled and packed away. At one end of the cliff, the mining equipment lay piled in a litter. There was a heap of discarded ore, where Grantline had carted and dumped it after his first crude refining process had yielded it as waste. The ore slag lay like gray powder flakes strewn down the cliff. Tracks and ore carts along the ledge stood discarded, mute evidence of the weeks and months of work these helmeted miners had undergone, struggling upon this airless, frowning world. But now all that was finished. The radioactive ore was sufficiently concentrated. It lay, this treasure, in a seventy-foot pile behind the glassite lean-to, with a cage of wires over it and an insulation barrage guarding its gamma rays from escaping to mark its presence. The ore shelter was dark. The other two buildings were lighted, and there were small lights mounted at intervals about the camp and along the edge of the ledge. A spider ladder, with tiny platforms some twenty feet one above the other, hung precariously to the cliff face. It descended the five hundred feet to the crater floor, and behind the camp it mounted the jagged cliff face to the upper rim height, where a small observatory platform was placed. Such was the outer aspect of the Grantline treasure camp, near the beginning of this lunar night, when unbeknown to Grantline and his score of men, the planetara with its brigands was approaching. The night was perhaps a sixth advanced. Full night. No breath of cloud to mar the brilliant starry heavens. The quadrant earth hung poised like a giant mellow moon over Grantline's crater. A bright earth, yet no air was here on this lunar surface to spread its light. Only a glow, mingling with the spots of blue tube light on the poles along the cliff and the radiance from the lighted buildings. The crater floor was dimly purple. Beyond the opposite upper rim, from the camp height, the towering top of distant Archimedes was visible. No evidence of movement showed about the silent camp. Then a pressure door in an end of the main building opened its tiny series of locks. A bent figure came out. The lock closed. The figure straightened and gazed about the camp. Grotesque, bloated semblance of a man. Helmeted, with rounded dome hood suggestion of an ancient sea diver, yet goggled and trunked, like a gas-masked fighter of the twentieth-century war. He stooped presently and disconnected metal weights which were upon his shoes. Then he stood erect again, and with giant strides bounded along the cliff, fantastic figure in the blue-lit gloom, a child's dream of crags and rocks and strange lights with a single monstrous figure in seven-league boots. He went the length of the ledge in his twenty-foot strides, inspected the lights, and made adjustments came back and climbed with agile bounding leaps up the spider ladder to the dome on the crater top. A light flashed on up there. Then it was extinguished. The goggled, bloated figure came leaping down after a moment, Grantline's exterior watchman making his rounds. He came back to the main building, fastened the weights on his shoes, signaled within. The lock opened. The figure went inside. It was early evening, after the dinner hour, and before the time of sleep, according to the camp routine Grantline was maintaining. 9 p.m. of Earth Eastern American time, recorded now upon his Earth chronometer. In the living room of the main building, Johnny Grantline sat with a dozen of his men dispersed about the room, whiling away as best they could the lonesome hours. All as usual, this cursed moon, when I get home, if I ever do get home. Say your say, Wilkes but you'll spend your share of the gold leaf and thank your constellations that you had your chance. Oh, let him alone. Come on, Wilkes, take a hand here. This game's no good with three. The man who had been outside flung his hissing helmet recklessly to the floor and unsealed his suit. Here, get me out of this. 
No, I won't play. I can't play your cursed game with nothing at stake. Commissioner's orders. A laugh went up at the sharp look Johnny Grantline flung from where he sat reading in a corner of the room. Commander's orders. No gambling gold leafers tolerated here. Play the game, Wilkes, Grantline said quietly. We all know it's infernal doing nothing. He's been struck by earthlight, another man laughed. Commander, I told you not to let that guy Wilkes out at night. A rough but good-natured lot of men, jolly and raucous by nature in their leisure hours. But there was too much leisure here now. Their mirth had a hollow sound. In older times, explorers of the frozen polar zones had to cope with inactivity, loneliness, and despair. But at least they were on their native world. The grimness of the moon was eating into the courage of Grantline's men. An unreality here, a weirdness. These fantastic crags, the deadly silence. The nights, almost two weeks of earth time in length, congealed by the deadly frigidity of space. The days of black sky, blaring stars, and flaming sun, with no atmosphere to diffuse the daylight. Days of weird blending sheen of illumination, with most of the sun's heat, radiating so swiftly from the naked lunar surface that the outer temperature still was cold. And day and night, always the familiar beloved Earth disk hanging poised up near the zenith. From thinnest crescent to full Earth, and then steadily back again to crescent. All so abnormal, irrational, disturbing to human senses. With the mining work over, an irritability grew upon Grantline's men, and perhaps since the human mind is so wonderful, elusive a thing, there lay upon these men an indefinable sense of impending disaster. Johnny Grantline felt it. He thought about it now as he sat in the room corner watching Wilkes being forced into the Plaget game, and he found it strong within him. Unreasonable, ominous depression. Barring the accident which had disabled his little spaceship when they reached this small crater hole, his expedition had gone well. His instruments, and the information he had from the former explorers, had picked up the ore vein within a scant month of search. The vein had now been exhausted, but the treasure was here. Nothing was left but to wait for the planetara. The men were talking of that now. She ought to be well midway from here to Ferakshan by now. When do you figure she'll be back and signal us? Twenty days. Give her another five now to Mars, and five in port. That's ten. We'll pick up her signal in three weeks, mark me. Three weeks? Just give me three weeks of reasonable sunrise and sunset. This cursed moon. You mean, Williams, next daylight? Ha! He's inventing a lunar language. You'll be a moon man yet, if you live here long enough. Olaf Swenson, the big blonde fellow from the Scandia Fjords, came and flung himself down by Grantline. I tank de bane without enough to do, Commander. If the aura just would not give out. Three weeks. It isn't very long, Ollie. No, maybe not. From across the room, somebody was saying, If the comet hadn't smashed on us, damn me, but I'd ask the commander to let some of us take her back. The discarded equipment could go. Shut up, Billy. She is smashed. The little comet, cruising in search of the ore, had come to grief just as the ore was found. It lay now on the crater floor, with its nose bashed into an upflung spire of rock, wrecked beyond repair. Save for the prearrangement with the Planetara, the Grantline party would have been helpless here on the moon. Knowledge of that, although no one ever suspected but that the Planetara would come safely, served to add to the men's depression. They were cut off, virtually helpless on a strange world. Their signaling devices were inadequate even to reach Earth. Grantline's power batteries were running low. He could not attempt wide-flung signals without jeopardizing the power necessary for the routine of his camp in the event of the planetara being delayed. Nor was his electro-telescope adequate to pick small objects at any great distance. All of Grantline's effort in truth had gone into equipment for the finding and gathering of the treasure. The safety of the expedition had to that extent been neglected. Swinchen was mentioning that now. You all agreed to it, Johnny said shortly. Every man here voted that, above everything, what we wanted was to get the radium. A dynamic little fellow, this Johnny Grantline. Short of temper sometimes, but always just, and a perfect leader of men. In stature, he was almost as small as Snap, but he was thick-set, 
with a smooth-shaven, keen-eyed, square-jawed face, and a shock of brown tousled hair. A man of thirty-five, though the decision of his manner, the quiet dominance of his voice made him seem older. He stood up now, surveying the blue-lit glassite room with its low ceiling close overhead. He was bow-legged. In movement he seemed to roll with a stiff-legged gait, like some sea captain of former days on the deck of his swaying ship. Queer-looking figure. Heavy flannel shirt and trousers, boots heavily weighted, and bulky metal-loaded belt strapped about his waist. He grinned at Swenson. When we divide this treasure, everyone will be happy, Ollie. The treasure was estimated by Grantline to be the equivalent of ninety millions in gold leaf. A hundred and ten millions in the gross as it stood now, with twenty millions to be deducted by the Federated Refiners for reducing it to the standard purity of commercial radium. Ninety millions, with only a million and a half to come off for expedition expenses, and the Planetara Company's share another million. A nice little stake. Grantline strode across the room with his rolling gait. Cheer up, boys. Who's winning there? I say, you fellows. An audiophone buzzer interrupted him, a call from the duty man in the instrument room of the nearby building. Grantline clicked the receiver. The room fell into silence. Any call was unusual. Nothing ever happened here in the camp. The duty man's voice sounded over the room. Signal's coming. Not clear. Will you come over, Commander? Signals. It was never Grantline's way to enforce needless discipline. He offered no objection when every man in the camp rushed through the connecting passages. They crowded the instrument room where the tense duty man lay bending over his helio receivers. The mirrors were swaying. The duty man looked up and met Grantline's gaze. I ran it up to the highest intensity, Commander. We ought to get it, not let it pass. Low scale, Peter? Yes. Weakest infrared. I'm bringing it up, even though it uses too much of your power. The duty man was apologetic. Get it, said Grantline shortly. I had a swing a minute ago. I think it's the Planetara. Planetara? The crowding group of men chorused it. How could it be the Planetara? But it was. The call presently came in clear. Unmistakably, the Planetara turned back now from her course to Farrakh Shan. How far away, Peter? The duty man consulted the needles of his dial scale. Close. Very weak infrared, but close. Around 30,000 miles, maybe. It's Snap Dean calling. The planetara here within 30,000 miles. Excitement and pleasure swept the room. The planetara's coming had for so long been awaited so eagerly. The excitement communicated to Grantline. It was unlike him to be incautious, yet now with no thought save that some unforeseen and pleasing circumstance had brought the planetara ahead of time, incautious Grantline certainly was. Raise the ore barrage. I'll go. My suit is here. A willing volunteer rushed out to the ore shed. The gamma rays, which in the helio room of the planetara came so unwelcome to Snap and me, were loosed. Can you send, Peter? Grantline demanded. Yes, with more power. Use it. Johnny dictated the message of his location which we received. In his incautious excitement, he ignored the secret code. An interval passed. The ore was occulted again. No message had come from us, just Snap's routine signal in the weak infrared, which we hoped Grantline would not get. The men crowding Grantline's instrument room waited in tense silence. Then Grantline tried the telescope. Its current weakened the lights with a drain upon the distributors, and cooled the room with a sudden deadly chill as the Arendt's insulating system slowed down. The duty man looked suddenly frightened. You'll bulge out our walls, Commander. The internal pressure. We'll chance it. They picked up the image of the planetara. It came from the telescope and shone clear on the grid. The segment of star field with a tiny cigar-shaped blob. Clear enough to be unmistakable. The planetara. Here now over the moon, almost directly overhead, poised at what the altimeter scale showed to be a fraction under 30,000 miles. The men gazed in awed silence. The planetara coming. But the altimeter needle was motionless. The planetara was hanging poised. A sudden gasp went about the room. The men stood with whitening faces, gazing at the planetara's image. And at the altimeter needle. It was moving. The planetara was descending, but not with an orderly swoop. 
The image showed the ship clearly. The bow tilted up, then dipped down. But then in a moment it swung up again. The ship turned partly over, righted itself, then swayed again drunkenly. The watching men were stricken into horrified silence. The planetara's image momentarily, horribly, grew larger, swaying, then turning completely over, rotating end over end. The planetara, out of control, was falling. End of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings Chapters 19 and 20